Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I've had many Sasquatch sightings throughout my youth, and I'd like to share a couple of the ones that stand out to me. My name is Maggie. I'm now 54 years young, and I grew up on a very rural farm in Indiana. I was the second youngest of seven brothers and sisters, and it's ever since I can remember that our family, as well as our neighbors, knew about the mountain men. The mountain men were notorious for roaming the region and sometimes even stealing livestock if you mistakenly left them with the opportunity to do so. Now, we didn't have any mountains where we lived, so I can't provide much of an explanation as to why we gave them the name mountain men. I suppose it was because they just looked like they would come from a secluded mountainous area. My siblings and I were always warned not to step foot outside our fence at nighttime. There were even quite a few occasions where we weren't allowed to leave the house on account that the mountain men seemed to be more active than usual. My mother would often reassure us that these creatures weren't interested in us humans, but it was still a wise decision to avoid them whenever possible. Since my father wasn't into hunting, we usually had a pretty good idea of what he was doing when we'd see him storm outside with his rifle in hand. Of course, for the sake of keeping us calm, especially the younger ones, he'd provide us with the excuse that the neighbor's dog had been rummaging through the cornfield. When I grew older, I gained a more accurate idea of what was concerning the old man. Anyway, that was all just a little bit of a backstory to give you some sense of the environment I grew up around. I'll now tell you about my first up-close encounter with the mountain men. The reason that the following encounter is so significant for me is that it was the first time that I saw these things with great detail. They weren't covered by the fence or the trees, and they weren't moving at a speed that made it nearly impossible to see them. That's something that they're capable of, by the way. I was seven years old at the time, and I was with my oldest sister, who was 16 years young. We had a beautiful pond in the middle of our acreage, and my sister and I decided to get in our family paddle boat and row out into the middle of it. I'd say about half of this pond was surrounded by trees and grassland, but both of us somehow failed to notice that what was watching us from across as we entered the boat from a small wooden dock. I could remember that my sister was in the middle of telling me some funny story and making me hysterically laugh when I suddenly caught sight of the face that was poking its way out from the side of a tree. Its facial expression was blank, and I don't remember it blinking one bit. It was such a surreal moment, in the sense that I had always known them to exist, but like so many other rare animals out there, I had yet to lock eyes with one of them. For me, this took the phenomena to a whole new level and made things feel so much more real. I don't necessarily recall feeling all that scared at first. However, I do remember a hint of unease creeping its way in when I observed my sister's body language. Her mouth was slightly ajar, and I distinctly remember that her trembling hands were causing the paddles to vibrate against the side of the boat. Should we go inside? I asked my sister. I think it's a better idea to remain still, she whispered. 
I've never seen them this close before. It feels weird. Other family members had claimed to have gotten close to them, but this was also her first time getting a good look at one of them. I know that this sounds strange, given that she was 16 years old, but even though we all knew they were around us, the mountain men were still very elusive to the eye. It was much more common to hear them in the distance, rather than being able to spot them. There was no question that my father was the one to have seen them the most by this point. But I am confident that even he would find a close encounter of this kind to be more startling than most. As I realized that we were now drifting closer to the side of the pond where our watcher stood, I began to poke my sister, deeply hoping that she was going to begin paddling us back toward the dock. But still, she seemed too nervous to do much of anything. Seeing as how we were probably less than thirty yards from the shore, I stripped the handles from my sister's grip and tried to turn the little rowboat around. It wasn't long after I did this that the Sasquatch tilted its chin upward and made a hoo sound, much like what you'd hear from a large owl. Even though it was creepy to see the sound come from its lips, I can't say that it felt all that aggressive. Even having grown up around these things, I still have very little clue as to why it made that exact noise at that time. I would be more understanding if my sister and I had yet to locate it, and it was simply mimicking another species to conceal its presence. However, it was completely oblivious that it was aware we were both staring right at it. It was either the noise or the fact that her little sister had essentially ripped the paddles from her hand, but she was quick to take them back and reclaim the protector role. Since she was much stronger than me back then, she was able to move us away from the animal at a much quicker rate. Then things got even weirder. It wasn't too long before we made it to the dock that the Sasquatch revealed itself entirely and diagonally, strolled over to the water's edge. It was right away that I was able to see that it was a male, if you know what I mean. Likely due to my age, I remember being pretty grossed out by that little detail. I remember I couldn't help but let out a little shriek on account that I thought that the thing was about to enter the water and swim after us. Instead, all it did was crouch right in front of the water before submerging its head in a completely upside-down position. It held it there in that position for somewhere between 5 and 10 seconds, and then slowly withdrew it before returning its gaze onto us from the other side of the pond. It was at that point that we exited the rowboats as calmly as possible and proceeded to walk out of that area. Immediately leading up to the dock was a narrow clearing that ran between two walls of thick prairie land. And it was as we were walking through there that I heard that who sound one more time. When I looked over my shoulder, the Sasquatch was essentially skipping its way back into the wood. When I say skipping, I mean that. Its stride were just so elongated in this motion. From time to time, our family would stumble upon tracks, primarily following days of heavy rainfall. What I always thought was most peculiar about these tracks was how their feet often appeared to move about the terrain in a symmetrical single file line. The skipping movement that I watched this one make while it headed back into the woods would certainly match many sets of tracks that we found. Both my sister and I were anxious that the Sasquatch might have intended to make its way around the pond to confront us, but we made it back to our house without any further sign of the thing. I remember that my father wasn't home at the time, and when we walked through the door and told my mother about the sighting, I'm pretty sure it was later that night that my parents had a serious discussion about it. 
I have vivid memories of my father seeming very discouraged after hearing that the Sasquatches were willing to reveal themselves during daylight. It was quite clear that this notion worried him. Understandably, he and my mother didn't want to have to worry about the kids during all hours of the day. After the internet blew up and became what now seems like a life necessity, I began to read what other people had to say about these animals. It immediately impressed me how many people from so many different parts of the country had had similar experiences to my own. However, I will say I've never read any other encounters where someone watched one of these things dunk its head into the water and hold the position. Maybe it was just playing around, even trying to get a rise out of my sis and me. I'd also like to note that I've seen many, many images of tracks on the internet, and I believe that quite a few of them are legitimate findings. I say this because many of them have that single file stride to them, and I know with certainty that they often move around in that fashion. The other strange encounter that I'd like to write about happened about seven years later, when I was in my early teens. The funny thing is that this was the first year that we started raising goats. We started with a mother and three or four babies. They were a lot of fun and had a ton of energy that enabled them to play all day. Unfortunately, it quickly became evident that hosting these lovable critters attracted more activity from the mountain men, and that quickly put a damper on what started as a very positive addition to our property. It was a summer day, and I remember I was sitting at the kitchen table working on homework for a summer school course that I was attending during the weekday mornings. My little brother suddenly burst into the house, screaming about how it had just ripped one of the baby goats from his bare hands. I'm not exactly sure why I thought he was kidding around at first, but it was probably because the mountain men rarely came close to us. If they were ever that close, we didn't know about it. My father wasn't home at the time when my brother was bantering about the baby goat abduction, and the incident was enough to bring tears to the kid's eyes, something he was known to do rarely. I ran up the stairs to one of my sister's old rooms. The family knew that this room provided the best view of our extensive backyard. It was right as I arrived at the window that I saw the first figure dashing toward the woods to the left. Though the sight was at least 80 yards out, the position of the mountain man's arms made it clear that it was carrying something that is thought to be of great value, another small goat. It was by the time that I had already made my way down the steps that I heard the sound of the front door opening. My mother had fetched the rifle and fired a couple of shots into the air as she stepped off the back porch. When I peered outside through the back door, I noticed another figure dashing off into the same direction as the previous one. It also carried one of the goats in its grasp and barked in our direction. There was no question that it didn't appreciate the noise of the gunfire. I'm not sure what came over my mother, but... I watched as she rushed toward the area where the goats lived. Since she had always been reluctant to go where the mountain men had been spotted, I've always looked at her reaction as clear evident that she fell in love with these little goats. Worried about her well-being, it wasn't long before I followed her lead. When we arrived at the pen, the only goat that was left was the doe, and it was instantly obvious that her neck had snapped like a twig. It was a horrifying sight, and even though they had previously given me the creeps, I believe this was the first time I ever felt like I was truly in danger living among these beings. My brother was still teary-eyed when we returned inside, 
visibly traumatized by what had allegedly happened to him. Very understandable. My father returned home not too long after that, and we sat him down to explain what had happened. When he sprung up to fetch the rifle, this was when my mother gently put her hand on his shoulder and stated that she wanted to move out of the area. She talked about how the stress had been eating away at her for years, and that she viewed this particular incident as a very bad omen, that it would just be too hard for her to disregard and continue living around these mysterious beings. However, I was expecting my father to throw a fit, but he didn't. I'm not sure whether it was my mother's perturbed demeanor or if he had been worrying just as much, but he caved and it wasn't long before we listed the property for sale. Though we remained in Indiana, we moved to a much more urban suburb far away from the sticks. I've always wondered if my parents informed the buyer about the things that lived in the region. I remember asking a few times, but both my mother and father would always give very vague responses. I guess I can't blame them if they didn't disclose that kind of information. After all, what were they meant to say? There's always been a part of me that's wanted to return to the area and ask some of the locals about any present-day activity. But even though we lived out there for quite a few years, we never became very close with any of the neighbors. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!